from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. The count's three to two and the bases are loaded. And Ted Williams is at bat, huh, McGraw? Oh, Johnny, how'd you know it was me? Oh, just psychic, I guess. What's on your mind, Bert? A fellow named Henry Sampson. Ever hear of him? Mm, name's familiar. Well, it should be. He owns about half the newspapers in the South. Which means he isn't exactly struggling for money, huh? Right. In fact, he collects it. Figures. Especially Confederate money. Well, anybody can... What? Yes, sir, Johnny. He has one of the largest collections of old coins in this country. Oh? And a Confederate half dollar he owns has disappeared. Bert, Confederate money isn't worth its weight in salt. That's where you're all wrong, Johnny. Huh? This particular half buck is insured for $20,000. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Providential Assurance Company, 393 Dewey Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Confederate coinage matter. Expense account item one, $1.20 taxi from my apartment to Bert McGraw's office. He was seated behind a haze of cigar smoke, reading a magazine. Oh, Johnny, come in, come in. Hey, morning, Bert. Yeah, sit down. I was just reading about an old teammate of mine. Oh, who's that? Bob Feller. Feller? Yeah, he was a pretty fair country pitcher. Of course, he wasn't in my class. Of course. Yeah. Many's the time I had to help old Bob out of a spot. Yes, sirree, Bob. That boy could get himself into more jams. Well, I remember... I what... didn't know you played with the Cleveland Indians, Bert. What? Well, I... <coughs> Blasted cigar. <coughs> <coughs> You've been reading up on baseball, Johnny? No, but I remember Bob Feller, who doesn't. In 1940, I saw him pitch a no-hit, no-run game for the Indians. Oh. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. You and me, we must be talking about two different fellers. Yes, sir. That's so? Why, sure. This Bob Feller that was my teammate, he played ball for the Apalachicola Alligators. Yes, sir. Good old Bob Feller. Spelled it F-A-L-L-E-R. Feller. Yeah. 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 Now, Johnny, about this Henry Sampson thing. His secretary called here just before I talked to you. Told me the coin had been stolen. Well, now, what makes that particular coin worth 20000 Bert? Well, like I said, it's Confederate money, a silver half dollar, and where it was minted or something, that's what does it, I guess. Where was it minted? New Orleans. Now, during the whole time of the Civil War, that mint only turned out four half dollars. How come? Well, how should I know? I'm only going by what's on Sampson's original policy application. But you're sure about there being only four of those half dollars? Well, no, I'm not sure. You mean you've never checked? You insured the thing on Samson's say-so? Well, Johnny, uh, look, we were glad to get his business. Well, you must have been out of your Oh, mind. now, stop balking, Johnny. You want to know how come that mint didn't make any more of them? You go ask him. I plan to. Where'd you say he lived? Right outside Birmingham, place called Shade Mountain. Expense account item two, $107, air transportation, Hartford to Birmingham, Alabama. I claimed my luggage and was about to step into a cab when I was approached by a man of about 30, crew cut, Brooks Brothers Soup. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. My name is Kopeck, Michael Kopeck. I'm Mr. Sampson's secretary. Oh, yeah. Your Mr. McGraw was good enough to tell me the time of your arrival. Are you all ready to go to Zora? Zora? According to the Bible, it was the village of Sampson. Oh. Oh, yes. Only I'd like to check into a hotel and freshen up a bit first. That is, if you don't mind. Mr. Sampson would mind, sir. But look, I've been... He aboard instructed the... me to assign you a room in the guest house. I'm sure you will find it more than comfortable, Mr. Dollar. This way, please. Just outside, standing in a no-parking zone, was the Sampson limousine. A uniformed chauffeur took my bag, and about 40 minutes later, we passed through the gates of Zora, Sampson's private domain. Beside the main house, there were two guest houses, two swimming pools, a private zoo, stock farm, turkey ranch, and a number of cottages for the servants and maintenance people. Inside the main house, Kopeck led me down a long hall lined with statues and oil paintings and other art objects. Finally, he stopped and opened a heavy door. Henry Sampson was seated behind a large desk. 
And standing near him was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Mr. Dollar, sir. Thank you, Michael. I'll call when I need you. Yes, sir. Well, Johnny, come in. Come in, sir. You had a pleasant journey down, I hope. Yes, fine, thanks. Good, good. Would you like a sample of our southern hospitality, Mr. Dollar? Well, I, uh... uh... Forgive me, my dear. Johnny, this is Mrs. Sampson. Delilah, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. Sampson. In case my question confused you, Johnny, I meant would you like a drink? Uh, no thanks. Not just now. Uh, let the man catch his breath, Delilah. Now, Johnny, I, uh, let me get on my feet. Uh, I, I can't give you more than ten minutes of my time. So, let's get right down to business. This here's a display case that was broke into. Mm -hmm. None of your other coins were taken, huh? No, no. Whoever did it knew what they wanted. They got the most valuable one. What about this lock? Was it tampered with? Wouldn't have done them no good to tamper with it. It's the biggest and strongest as Yale makes. Reckon he knew that. That's why he broke the glass. Then you think someone familiar with this room and your collection took the coin? If you want to know the truth, he suspects me. Delilah. Um, Mr. Sampson, did anything unusual happen that evening? Did you have any visitors? None. Delilah and I ate our supper. I worked for a couple of hours, same as always. Then we played casino. Till 10.30. We always play yeah. casino until 10.30, John. It's the only thing that relaxes my husband. I see. There were only four people beside myself in the house. Mrs. Sampson, Mary, her maid, Digger, my manservant, and Michael, my secretary. Good old Michael, the trusty troubleshooter. <laughs> Mr. Sampson, according to your policy application, only four of those Confederate half-dollars were ever made. Is that right? Yes, it is. Confederate states didn't have any silver bullion to make more. Dirty Yankee blockade. Yeah. Uh, could you give me a description of the coin, sir? Sure. Originally, it was a regular Union 1861 piece. At the New Orleans Mint, they ground off the reverse side and, and stamped on the shield of the glorious Confederacy in the words, Confederate States of America. Hallelujah. It, May the South rise again. Now, that's not funny, Delilah. I think it is. Don't you, Johnny? Well, I'm just... Uh, you just give me your answer later. Right now, I'm going to have another drink. You ready? Not yet, thanks. No, you don't know what you're missing. You'll have to forgive my wife, Johnny. She isn't herself this evening. I haven't been myself in several years. Not since I married this You time. shut up, woman. Michael. Michael. Yes, sir? Mrs. Sampson is tired. Very tired. She wants you to take her to her room. Yes, sir. Hmm. Well... See you at supper, Johnny. I'll have your supper sent up to Don't you. Don't do me any favors, fat man. Get her out of here, Michael. Get her out before I... I'm sorry. But she... Sometimes... It's all right, she... sir. I understand. Do you? Good. Good man. Now then. Oh, that's better. Now, about the coin, President Jefferson Davis gave it to my great-grandpappy for his service to the cause. Are you sure of its value? You sure it's worth 20000 Why, shoot, boy, my grandpappy turned down 10000 for it back in 1879. The way things are now, <laughs> it's got to be worth four times that. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? I didn't say that. Well, then what are you looking at me so suspicious for? Well, Mr. Sampson, I have a hunch you're holding out on me. Johnny, you're getting paid money to find the 
person that took it. Now, you earn your pay. I'll try to. Only I'd appreciate some help. I'll give you help. In fact, I already have. Like how? Like the gates to Zora. I've kept them locked ever since it happened. And until you find that coin, nobody leaves here. Those gates stay closed. <laughs> A few moments later, Kopeck returned and escorted me across the magnolia-scented grounds to my rooms in one of the luxurious guest cottages. I unpacked, took a shower, then called Bert McGraw in Hartford. Well, how's it going, Johnny? It is not. Oh, come on now, boy. Sorry, Bert, but it looks like a real toughie. You don't want me to send in a pinch hitter, do you? Nope. But how about getting the dust off your pants and doing some legwork? All right, what kind of work? Find out for sure how many of those 1861 half dollars were ever made and what their value is today. Wait a minute. What'd you say, John? Not you, Bert. Somebody at the door. You check on that coin. Got it? Like the Yankees have the pennant. Good luck, boy. Okay, I'm coming. Yeah? Miss Dahl. Yeah, that's right. I'm Mary Williams, Miss Sampson's maid. And I'm Digger. Everybody just calls me old Digger. Uh, he's Mr. Sampson's man. We, we snuck off and come over here to see you. Oh, well, come in, please. Thank you, sir. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. Sure hope nobody saw us come in here. Well, uh, what's this all about, Mary? Mr. Dollar, being an insurance investigator, you work for a company instead of the police, is that it? Yes, the company I'm working for now is in Hartford, Connecticut. Way up north. Oh, that's good. Mr. Dollar... Digger here, he's just scared to death. Scared of what? If you'd be here a while, you'd know. God, you sure would. Well, can't you tell me? Mr. Sampson's got a big place here. He he needs lots of folks to keep it up for him, and, and he gets them cheap from the prisons. What? Yes, sir. Somebody finds out who's going out on parole, the next thing a man knows, instead of being all the way free, he's here working for Mr. Sampson. Yes, sir, and... And if and he don't like it, Mr. Sampson has him sent back. So. Oh, come on now. Look, this is 1957. Things like that just don't happen anymore. Tell him, Digger. Well, Mr. Dollar, sir, I don't want to go back to that place. No, sir, I don't ever want to go back. Oh, it's all right, Digger. Mr. Dollar, we wouldn't have bothered you at all, except that we, Digger and me, that is, we want to get married. That's right, yes. But if he's sent back to prison, well... Well, he's already spent 15 years there. And you're afraid that Mr. Sampson is going to send him back? Yes, sir. Mr. Sampson or, or somebody else around here. But why? Well, come on. One of you say something. Well, sir, I, I ain't going to tell you. Nobody else, Mr. Dollar. No, sir. I won't tell no matter what they do to me. I won't tell unless you give me your word. Unless you promise me. Promise you What? that you won't let Mr. Sampson or nobody send me back. You give me your word on the Bible, and I'll tell. Yes. Well, come on. Tell me what. Well, sir, I... Mr. Dollar, Digger knows who took that half-dollar piece. two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. The American writer Christopher Morley once wrote, when you sell a man a book, you don't sell him just 12 ounces of paper, ink, and glue. You sell him a whole new way of life, unquote. Now that goes double when you give, not sell, a book. But the gift of 550 books to little children increases the legacy tenfold. Near the end of 1960, the employees of the Chase Manhattan Bank started a people-to-people -people program with such a gift to school children of a town in Tanganyika. That's on the southeast coast of Africa. And to give you an idea how the books were received by the children, let me first quote from Francis Bacon. He's an English writer of a few centuries back. He said, some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. In the past, 
children in Tanganyika may have done a little tasting and chewing and a little swallowing and digesting, but there's one certain thing. They wound up devouring the books they received from the United States. And they did so much of it that they, the ones in high school anyway, were able to reach the level of English children their age and pass the exams at the same time. That takes a lot of book learning, as they say. Now, the gift of these books from the United States of America may have seemed a small thing to the senders, but the boys in Tanganyika who received them know that they've opened a whole new way of life. They've greatly increased understanding in the classroom of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Confederate coinage matter. I wanted to help Digger, the Samson servant who claimed to have information concerning the missing Confederate half dollar. But I couldn't promise him anything without first knowing more about the part he had played, if any, in the theft of the coin. I did promise to think over his offer and let him know if I was interested by the next afternoon. Anyway, at eight that evening, I joined Mr. Sampson and Kopeck for dinner in the large dining room. After we'd finished our coffee, Sampson rose and excused himself. Uh, 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 when you're ready, we got work to do, Michael. Yes, sir. Huh? See you in the morning, Johnny. Well, how is the investigation coming, Mr. Dollar? Have you found any valuable clues? No, nope, not a thing. Oh, that's too bad. But you you haven't given up. Kopeck, I haven't started. Uh-huh. Well, would you care for something else? If not... No, no, I'm fine. Then shall we... Yeah, sure. Say, uh, tell me something, Kopeck. Anything I can. What about the servants who were in the house the night of the theft? Digger and Mary? Yeah. What do you know about them? Everything that there is to know. I have a file containing the record on every one of Mr. Sampson's employees. If you like, I shall have the information on these two sent to your rooms. I'd appreciate it. Now, if you will excuse me, Mr. Sampson is waiting in the den. Uh, you can find your way back to the guest house. Mm -hmm. Sure. Good night. Good night, Mr. Dahl. Johnny. Hmm? Oh, Delilah. Oh, where are you? Up here, on the stairs. No, don't come up. Oh. Johnny, do you like to ride? Well, sure, only it's been a long time since I've had a chance to, and uh, I didn't bring any riding clothes. Well, that doesn't matter. Meet me at the stables before breakfast. You will, won't you, Johnny? What do you think? I went back to the guest house, and about half an hour later, Kopeck delivered the files on Mary Williams and Digger. Everything Digger had told me was true. He had spent 15 years in prison on a manslaughter charge. So early the next morning, I crossed the green lawns of Zora and met Delilah at the stables. And a few minutes later, we were riding our horses away from the main house. Where shall we ride, Johnny? You want the cook's tool? Oh, I don't know. What's it include? Oh, the turkey farm, dairy, and zoo. Or would you rather go down to the river? Hey, you know, it's a funny thing, Delilah. What is? I've never seen a river. <laughs> you fool. Come on, I'll race. Come on, boy. Come on. Finally, when we reached the river, we dismounted. And she just stood there for a long moment, looking down into the water. Well? I guess I'm just reaching for something I can't have. Yes. You understand, John? Why did you marry him, Delilah? His money. Only I was fooled. Or made a fool of. How do you mean? Well, he's a collector, John. Coins and paintings and people. Well, hadn't you noticed? I'm just another one of his possessions with all the rights and privileges of a statue. And you know why Samson married me? Because my parents named me Delilah. Well, why don't you leave him? Oh, I'd need money, a lot of it. And I thought I was going to get some. But now... But now? Maybe I'll get another chance. 
When I do. Johnny. Johnny, you keep in touch, huh? We rode on back, had breakfast, and I returned to my rooms in the guest cottage. Around 11 o'clock, I picked up the phone and called Bert McGraw again. Johnny, about time you called. Yeah, what'd you find out, Bert? Enough to know that I'm in trouble and you got to get me out of it. Trouble? What kind of trouble? That Confederate half dollar. Do you know what it's worth? 5000 What? But you insured it for twenty. I know it, but look, Johnny, it wasn't all my fault. I mean, well, how did Samson know about the dyes? What dyes? The dyes a man named Scott made 500 of those half dollars from back in 1879. That's what lowered the price of the original half dollar. You mean there are 500 of those half dollars in existence instead of four? Five hundred and four. The four original ones made in 1861, the rest were made later. Well, looks like you're out 20 grand, Bert. Oh, don't say that. Unless. Yeah? Unless you're willing to let me try something down here. Anything, Johnny boy, anything. Even if it costs five grand? Well, you know what'll happen to me if the company has to take a loss of 20,000 for something worth only five. Johnny, please go ahead. Thanks, pal. I'll call you later. As soon as I could, I sent word to Digger and Mary, the two servants, asking them to come to the guest house. It was almost three o'clock before they arrived. Miss Dollar, have you decided on what you're going to do? Yes, Mary, I have. Digger. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, sir? I can't promise that you won't be sent back to prison. Well, then I ain't going to tell you nothing. Now wait, Dollar, wait. Sir. Let me finish. But I can promise that I'll do everything possible to help you. Well, sir, I have to ask Miss Mary. You know, she's the one who talked me into coming to you in the first place. I did it as soon as he told me what he'd done. I didn't know about it till afterward, Mr. Dahl. All right. Just what did he do, Mary? Well, it wasn't his fault. He just had to break into that case and, and take that half dollar. Yeah, sir, that's right. I had to. Why? Because she said that she'd tell Mr. Sampson something real bad about me. Something that had caused him to send me back to prison. She? Mrs. Sampson? Yes, sir. That's the truth, Mr. Dollar. I swear it. I... <sighs> all right, Digger, go on. What happened after you took the coin? Well, sir, it all went like she said it would. I got hold of the half dollar and ran on down to the river. Late that night, I was on my way back to where I was supposed to meet Miss Sampson and give it to her. Well, sir, then I tripped over something and... Doggone if I didn't lose it. Oh, wait a minute. Come on now, Digger. You don't expect me to believe that. But it's the truth. Yes, sir. I had it in my hand, and when I fell, it flew out. And you can't find it? No, sir. No, sir. And I, and I looked and looked. There's a good reason why he can't find it, Mr. Dahl. Oh? Yes, sir. And you come with us. We'll show you. They showed me... And I had to agree, there was a good reason. I told Kopeck I wanted to see Mr. Sampson. While I was waiting for him, Delilah came down the stairs from her room. Johnny, I saw Digger take your suitcase out to the car. You aren't leaving. I will be in a few minutes. Well, I... Johnny, have you found the coin? No, not quite. But I know where it is. And I know how it got there. You do? Why did you do it, Delana? Why did you make him do it? You ought to know by now, Johnny. I did it for the same reason I've done everything else in my life, for money. I thought I could use the money to get away from here. What do you do now? I don't know. It's up to him. You do have to tell him, don't you? Yes, Delana. I'm afraid I do. There's no other way... I mean, well, couldn't you say one of the servants... No, Delilah, don't you say it either. Okay, John. See you around, hmm? Sure. See you around. Uh, come in, Johnny. Come in. I hear you have news for me. Well, boy... Start in. Tell me. I told him as simply as I could. 
When it was over, he got to his feet and stared out the window for several minutes. When he turned back, he ordered Kopeck to find Digger and take him to the place where the coin had been lost. A few minutes later, we joined him there. I can't believe it. This where you lost the half dollar, Digger? On the turkey farm? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Sampson, sir. Here, uh, right over there. Well, why didn't you get in there and find it? Well, I told Mr. Dollar how come I couldn't, sir. Well, Dollar? He couldn't find it because when he dropped the coin, one of those turkeys swallowed it. Dollar... What do you mean, one of those turkeys swallowed it? Well, sir, just what I said. Turkeys will eat anything that glistens or shines that's dropped near them. And since Digger was cutting across this field when he dropped the coin... But, but, boy, do you realize there are 2,000 turkeys in there and any one of them could have my half dollar? The half dollar Jefferson Davis... President of the glorious Confederacy gave my grandpappy. Any one of them could have it stuck in his skinny redneck. Yes, sir. It certainly could. Well, well, good. Good. Now, you just tell me, how do you propose to get me my half dollar back? You can't do it. You'll have to give me my insurance money. Yes, we know. That's why we're willing to buy the turkeys from you. What? Yes, sir. I'll give you $5,000 for the turkeys and guarantee to return the coin within 90 days, providing... Go on. Providing you allow Mary Williams and Digger to leave here and be responsible for the recovery of the coin. You mean you're going to let them tin the turkeys? I'm going to give them the turkey. What? Oh, Mr. Donner, you're a good man. Digger, you you miserable... You hush up. Well, well, Donner, you sly fox. Don't go and... Doggone, boy. You just got yourself 2,000 turkeys. A couple of weeks after I left Birmingham, I received a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Digger telling me that they'd found the coin in the craw of the bird they'd killed for their first Sunday dinner together. Which proves once again, miracles do happen. Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, $405.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the story of a tragedy that befell a sweet old widow and the very surprising results. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Eleanor Audley, Herb Ellis, Herb Vigran, Horace Lewis, and Vic Perrin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.